Physics time, we're going to talk about momentum. I've already got the equation for momentum up here. So we have P equals MV. Both P and V are vectors where P is momentum measured in kilogram meters per second. M is mass measured in kilograms and V is velocity measured in meters per second. Questions about this? So far we're good on this, right? Fairly simple equation. If we wanted to find velocity, for instance, what would we have to do? Manipulate it. We would just have to divide m over, giving us p over m equals v. Very, well, maybe I wouldn't say very, but fairly simple equation, right? We'll, we'll complicate it a little bit later on by adding um, what the moment of different particles or different objects are. Um, but in general, momentum is the property an object has when it's in motion. For instance, there's really no such thing as an object with zero mass, right? We wouldn't call it an object. Energy has zero mass, but that's basically never going to happen. But what if it stopped? What if, what if, like you, loafing on a couch, if you have no velocity at that time, what is your momentum? Zero. You've got no momentum, right? It's, it's perfectly possible for an object to have no momentum. Now, contrast this with inertia. Is it ever possible for you to have no inertia? No, because inertia depends on one thing only, your mass. And you've always got mass. An object always has mass. So the difference between inertia and momentum is that inertia is the tendency of an object to stay stopped if it's stopped or stay moving if it's moving. Whereas momentum is only when an object is in motion, right? Momentum we can sometimes think of, if you want a definition that isn't mathematical, momentum is how difficult it is to stop a moving object, right? So it, it depends on its mass, heavier objects are harder to stop, and it depends on its velocity, faster objects are harder to stop. So in that way, momentum is directly proportional to mass, and momentum is directly proportional to velocity. Okay? So everything, all matter always have iner has inertia, because inertia depends only on mass. But momentum also depends on velocity, and so only moving objects have momentum. Can I erase this so we can move on? Yes. Well, it looks nice and brown up here now. Okay, um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is this thing called uh, impulse. We'll come back to momentum when we talk about uh, conservation momentum. But for now, we're going to talk about impulse. So impulse, I don't know why, but I've always thought this is kind of tricky, but it, it really doesn't have to be. Um, we can think of it this way. The easiest way to think of it is this. J, which is impulse, equals delta P. That's, that's all it is. This is an even simpler equation, right? It's got the same number of characters, but what does delta mean? Change it. So really, there's only two quantities here. J is impulse. We'll talk about the units in a second. And delta P is change in momentum. In general, when we see delta in an equation, what is our, what do we break that delta into? Like if we had, uh, earlier we had delta V, which was, initial go ahead. And final. Yeah, initial and final. So it's going to be P sub F, right? Final momentum minus P sub naught initial momentum. So if this is our, really our only mathematical operation, right? we could rewrite this, by the way, as j equals p sub f minus p sub naught. But since it's only mathematically subtraction, what's the unit for momentum, or so for impulse going to be? If, if, if it's just, I'm sorry, did I say momentum? I meant, what's the unit for impulse going to be? If it's just momentum final minus momentum initial, what's the unit for impulse going to be? Okay, you're both right. You both said half of the answer, but together you're right. It's just, it's the same. It's just kilogram meters per second. It's the exact same. It's just a change in momentum. It's still measured in kilogram meters per second. For the first time ever, there's another way to calculate. Well, that's not true. We had, we had a lot of different ways to calculate um, distance for like uh, hang time and fall time and stuff. But let's talk about this too. J is also equal to j equals f t. So j is still impulse. j is impulse. f, what do you guess? Force, force measured in? Newtons. Newtons. And let's remember, what in SI base units, what is a newton equal to? Kilogram times meter per second. Yep, meter per second squared. Sorry, I, I meant to have a closed parenthesis here. Can you even see that at all on the screen? Uh, yeah, it's pretty close. So Newton, 
I'm sorry, I, I did run out of room here. I apologize for the way this looks. But force is measured in newtons, which you know is capital N, and a newton is equal to a kilogram times a meter per second squared, right? Kilogram times meters per second squared. Mass times acceleration. And T then, of course, is always time measured in seconds. seconds. So then look at this. If we have a newton, remind me again what a newton is. And we multiply it by a second, what's our answer going to be? Kilogram times meter per second. Perfect. And what does that look like? <gasps> this is the unit for impulse, which is also the unit for momentum, right? So same solution, just a different way to calculate it. Did you just do kilogram times mass over? Kilogram times meter. This is a meter yeah. over second squared times seconds gives us kilogram meter per second, which is the same as the unit for impulse, which is the same as the unit for momentum, right? So how will we know whether to use this or to use this? What you're given. What you're given, yeah. If you're given a force and a time, use this. If you're given a momentum, usually you won't be given a momentum, you'll be given probably what? Mr. Um, uh, what, what else could we give, be given instead of momentum? A, a, a mass and a velocity, right? Usually we'll be given a mass and a velocity. In fact, a lot of times, give me a second, I'll answer your question in a second. A lot of times we can even say, your book uh, says this, FT equals delta the quantity MV. Now, that's, uh, that's really as complicated as we can make this because look, force times time, what does that give us? Impulse, which is J. And this whole thing here is delta P, right? Which is also J. So basically this is just J equals J. But you should have this in your brain too. Hadley, what was your question? What is the abbreviation for force? Is that Newton's time? Newton's or kilogram times meter per second squared. Okay. So FT, force times time, equals the change in momentum. And here I've, I've replaced P momentum with the quantity M times V, right? You understand this is also P, right? MV. MV is P. P equals MV. Questions about any of this? So, so then what is impulse, right? We, we, we know what it is mathematically. Impulse is change in momentum. Um, but impulse obviously is different from momentum or we wouldn't have another word for it. Uh, so impulse really we can think of as, it's easier to think of in your brain as a force applied over a time. So the, the classic example, the, the one your book uses too, the classic example is if, you, if you're getting punched in the face, which I, I know you guys, I'm sure that probably happens quite a lot. If, if you're getting punched in the face, is it better to move into the punch or away from the punch? That's an easy question, right? What do you, what do you want to do? If you're going to get punched, which way should you move? Away. Away. But why, right? So physically, why? So we're going to have, here's the thing, we're going to have the same impulse no matter what. J equals FT, right? We're doing this a lot with big letter, little letter. This is another time for that. The impulse is going to stay the same. In both of those cases, you're getting punched in the face. In both cases, you have the same impulse. The dude had the same strength behind, it might be a lady. It probably is a lady if she's punching you. Um, the lady had the same impulse behind her swing both times, okay? So the same impulse. J is the same. Why do you want to go away from the punch? Well, first of all, your animal instinct says, let me get away from the thing that's going to hurt me. Okay, but because why? Yes, you're right. But it's going to do what? It's, yeah, it's going to make, make more time to heat. Her, her fist is going to be touching your face for longer, right? So longer time means what? Less force. Whereas a smaller time is more force. This is the same exact reason why if, if y'all are getting super angry, right, your brother, you got brothers, some of you have brothers, I know you do, or your tiny little sister is just peeving you off to no end, right? What are you going to go and punch? You shouldn't punch the door or the wall. What should you punch to unleash your frustration? The pillow. The pillow. Because in the same way, it increases your, the pillow gives with you, right? It increases the time that you're in contact with it and therefore decreases the force. If, you, if you're going to catch this, you better catch it. You, you naturally, because Mr. Barry has taught you well, you naturally move your arms with it as it's coming down, right? You know from playing softball or baseball or something that if you, oh, if you can't catch anything, you can't play baseball. If you, if you go with it, right, it increases the time you're touching it, therefore decreasing the force. Because the, the impulse, the change momentum is going to be the same no matter what. 
Does this making sense to you? Okay, mm -hmm. so um, let me just read this aloud to you. It says, the impulse momentum relationships helps, helps us to analyze a variety of situations where the momentum changes. Considering these familiar examples of impulse in the following cases of increasing and decreasing momentum. So, on the next page, it has figure 7.2. It says the force of impact on a golf ball varies throughout the duration of impact. What are we trying to do when we're hitting a golf ball? Which, which one of these do we want more of? We've got the same impulse no matter what because we have an equally strong golf swing. We want a shorter time, greater force. That's going to make the golf ball move farther. It's going to change. In both cases, the momentum will change the same. But in this one, we'll apply more force by applying it over less time. Right? Look at the next one, figure 7.3. If the change in momentum occurs over a long time, the force of the impact is small. So what did they crash into here? Look at figure 7.3 versus 7.4. It's a nice orange car with a person driving it. They, they, don't, they choose not to draw the person in the second picture because what has happened? In one case, they drove through a hay bale, right? And in the second case, they drove into a, a wall. So, with the hay bale, greater time of contact, therefore less force. With the wall, smaller time of contact, and therefore more force. And then look, here's the classic example I was just telling you about. That guy looks, I know some people that look like that. The same change in momentum is going to happen no matter what. But he wants to decrease the force, and therefore he needs to increase the amount of time. That's why you, there's a word for this. You, you roll with the punches. You roll with the punches. That's what's called. And that's a, that's a metaphor for your lives, too. Some of you could learn that metaphor because to roll with the punches in your life means when something's coming at you, you just you have to move with it, right? You can't, you can't stand there obstinately and choose not to do it because if you roll with the punches, you're going to be better off. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So we're still talking about impulse, but now, now that we have kind of an understanding, I hope, of what impulse is in general, we're going to talk about this, this neat bit that I love, which is called bouncing. Uh, and I like the way that they have worded this. If a flower pot falls from a shelf onto your head, this is the kind of situations you find yourselves in as an adult, you may be in trouble. If it bounces from your head, you may, may be in more serious trouble. Why? Because impulses are greater when an object bounces. Let's just write that. Let's just write that down right away. Impulse is greater when an object bounces. Impulse is greater when an object bounces. In this case, it's going to be more useful for us to think of this. J equals delta P, which I'm going to substitute J equals delta the quantity MV. So in this case, the impulse isn't going to be the same. In one, it's going to bounce, and in the other, it isn't. So here's you. Who wants to be in the drawing? No one cares, whatever. Here's you. Thanks, Hadley. It's fun to draw Hadley. Okay, because um, of the hair, curly hair. Um, okay, in both of these cases, this is not two different Hadleys. This is just the same thing happening to Hadley twice. Your hair's on fire. Whatever. Okay, and we're going to use that same example. We're going to say the flower pot is going to fall on Hadley's head. This is how you draw a flower pot. Um, Sure. Looks like maybe burning incense too. Whatever. Something's going to fall on Hadley's head. In case one, it's going to bounce, and in case two, it isn't. So let's look at this. So, impulse is change in momentum, right? If it doesn't bounce, assume these have the same mass, m. Same mass, m. When it falls on her head, how is the impulse going to change? Well, it's going to go from whatever the velocity was down, right, to what? No, it's not bouncing. To what? What's the velocity going to be if it doesn't it's bounce? Gonna, What's it going to do when it hits your head? What's the velocity going to be? It's going to. Yeah, it's going to have. Yeah, well, hold on a second. We're going to get to that in a second. But yes, the, to zero. So velocity down to zero. Whereas when it does bounce, velocity down to what? To zero and then back up. Yeah, to velocity, to overall, to back up, right? In fact, if it bounces to the same height it got from where it started, it has not only increased the impulse, but it has doubled the impulse. So in this case, we went, so it's mv, right? j equals delta mv, once again. The mass is going to stay the same, but in instance one, I'm 
just going to call this one, and I'm going to call this two. In instance one, j equals delta, mass didn't change, and velocity is just going to be, uh, sorry, let me do this. Velocity initial minus zero, right? Where this is going to be, if it bounces the same height, velocity initial minus velocity final, which equals two. So the impulse is going to be twice as much, delta m times two v. Does that kind of make sense? Because basically, instead of just falling and sitting, going to zero velocity, it falls and then goes back up. So it has to reverse the velocity almost twice as much. A demonstration that has sometimes worked in the past, and I didn't get it set up for today, I wish I had because it would have been cooler, um, but I'll just explain it to you. Um, we've done this with the door in the past, we've done it with books, but I have somewhere in the back, and I'll show you this tomorrow if I can remember, uh, a racquetball, right? You know about a racquetball. Mm -hmm. And a balloon that I have filled with flour so that it's the exact same way as the racquetball. They have the exact same mass. Except one bounces and one doesn't, obviously, right? The racquetball is going to bounce, the balloon full of flour is not going to bounce. And so what we do is, the, the best way I've done it is I, I have them both on a pendulum, like they're both going to swing. Can right? you please do this? Yeah, we are. I just don't have it set up right now, so like I said, we'll do it tomorrow. Oop, draw them the same size, you idiot. Okay. Um, have them set up on a swing so that when you pull them, they come back, right? And then I have the same book set up the same distance away. And the racquetball, because it bounces, knocks the book over. And the ball of flour does not. So nothing else has changed other than the, the racquetball bounces, right? Its momentum changes twice as much because it goes from velocity this way to velocity this way. Does that kind of make sense? And it's, it's hard to do in the other way, but if you throw them both at the door with roughly the same speed, the racquetball will open the door almost twice as far as the balloon full of flour. Bouncing. This is absolutely one of my favorite things in physics. I love talking about bouncing. So if you're going to get hit in the head with a baseball bat because you angered someone, go with, don't, go with it and don't let it bounce. Right? Don't let the don't let the baseball bat bounce off your head. You'll die. Okay. Let's move on. So that's bouncing. Do you have questions about bouncing? Yeah. Bouncing is actually a really important part of physics, and it's obviously much more complicated than what we just talked about. But that's the rundown on bouncing. Well, what did that problem? Um, J equals delta M VF minus V naught, or maybe 2V. It said 2V, the last one said 2V. Uh, and therefore, the, it would be 2J if there's no friction. Um, I was going to say something, then I got distracted. Okay, whatever, let's move on. Conservation of momentum. Oops, should have erased this too. Conservation of momentum. Oh, uh, I was going to, I'm sorry, let's back up one second. There's this picture that I really like in your book also. It's called the Pelton Wheel. If you're on the YouTube, or if you watch this later on YouTube, you can look up a picture of the Pelton Wheel. Um, basically, uh, and I'll kind of draw it on here. There, before the Pelton Wheel, water wheels, which is that, you know, it's like it happens at a mill. Like the water goes by and it makes the mill move, right? So before the Pelton Wheel, the water would go by and it would make the mill move. Good. But the Pelton wheel is invented, and what it has is this little, like, scoop at the end. So now, instead of the water just going by, it has to, the water has to reverse because of the shape of this. Right? So it imparts, it imparts twice the impulse, which makes this wheel not necessarily move twice as fast, but it has twice the momentum change, and therefore it can do more flour grinding or generating electricity or whatever because it has been given twice the momentum from the same speed of water. Does that kind of make sense? There's a, a, the picture in your book is obviously better than this. Um, it says, the curved blades cause water to bounce and make a U-turn, producing a large impulse that turns the wheel. So you can do, you can, really what it does, generally, is these things are set up such that whatever it's going to do, as long as the wheel's turning, it's going to do it. But all it does is make it so that it'll still work, even if the stream speed is lower than what would make this one work. Okay, anyway. Once again, that's not conservation momentum, that's, st that's still bouncing. I just wanted to draw your attention to that. So, back to conservation of momentum. In a nutshell, give me, what can we say the conservation of momentum is? 
we saw it in the mechanical universe video. What, what, just there we go. We can say the total amount of momentum in the universe stays the same. Okay. So, the guy that said that was his name started with a D. Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes. And he's not the only person to have ever said that, or he wasn't even the first, but that was one of his ideas. Um, Rene Descartes. We talked about how uh, it's obvious to us that if, if I were to roll something across the floor, or even if I were to throw something in the air, eventually it would slow down and stop, right? And why is that? Because of friction. Yeah, remember in a frictionless environment, neither one of those things will happen. But because of friction, does that mean that the law of conservation of momentum is not true? No, it just transfers the motion that that macro object had into making the particles that make up it move faster, right? It makes it warm instead. So the particles have more motion than they did before, but the thing itself has less motion. So momentum is conserved in all cases. Even when we talk about what's called later, we're going to talk about an inelastic collision. But basically it's this. And we can write this as an equation, which is a of another very simple equation, but basically P sub naught equals P sub F. For a given interaction, for a given system, the momentum it had, we can even do it this way. Let's do it this way. The sum of the initial momentum equals the sum of the final momentum. Right? If we add all the momenta together and then a collision occurs, it's going to have that same total of momenta after. They're called sigmas. sigmas. Collisions. There are two types of collisions. Inelastic and elastic. Can you guess what's going to be true in, in elastic and inelastic collisions? First of all, it's a collision. That's, that's the easy question. What's a collision? When, when things collide, right? When things crash into each other. In, in an inelastic collision, what do you think? It does yeah, they don't bounce back. The things collide, objects collide, then behave as one object. Right? They collide and they stick together. They're inelastic. Give me an example of an inelastic collision. Like cars. Yeah, when cars get in a crash. They crash together and they stay like locked together. And then even if they're still moving, they move together as one, right? Or the example your book uses is when train cars are coupled together. There's a train car that's still, right? Another train car comes along and then they couple and then they move as the first. What must happen? If the mass is increased, what must happen if we have the same momentum? Yeah, they will, they'll, they'll slow down, right? Negating friction, they'll just slow down. Whereas in an inelastic collision, the objects collide and then what? So exactly like the Opposite I'm sorry, what was your They behave as opposite Yeah, objects collide different. and then continue to behave as separate objects. Yeah, separate. And Jay, your question? That was like the pool thing. Yeah. Bumper cars. Yeah, bumper cars. Pool. Um, the, the perfect example of this is there's something called an ideal gas where the atoms are supposed to behave as perfectly inelastic collisions. They're supposed to bounce off with the same energy. Basically, and this is a little simplistic, but when you're doing your math for these, and I'll help you with the math, but when you're doing your math with these, these, for inelastic collisions, the masses add together, and then we have to calculate a new velocity, given a certain momentum. Continue to, what is that? Behave as separate objects. So once again, write this down, please. Um, in inelastic collisions, we have to add the masses together and then calculate a new velocity, usually. And in elastic collisions, the momentums just switch. So if the object, if one object was stopped and another object was moving, now they switch and the object that was moving stops and the object that wasn't moving moves. Or if they're both moving, they just switch and they go the opposite directions. Okay? Questions? We'll do some work with the math of this, but do you have questions right now? No. We'll do vector addition with this as well, so be prepared for that. Bye.